Everything I do in my life, the people I know, the places I go, the things I buy, the books I read, is being recorded and collected by companies and governments. Even when I, when I walk around in the streets, I'm carrying my smartphone. When I go online, I'm using a search engine. When I'm talking to friends, I'm communicating through Facebook or social media or some other service. And these companies are collecting vast amounts of information about me that can influence all kinds of aspects of my life. I want to have control of that personal information. I want my privacy back. Privacy in the digital age is about being able to control your own personal information. This doesn't mean keeping it under lock and key, but it means being able to make informed choices about what information is shared about you, how that information is used, and where it goes forward. An average morning for an average guy in average town. I wake up and watch my smartphone for the alarm clock. Vodafone knows I woke up. Google knows I have an appointment at 9. And what kind of breakfast I prefer. Google also knows how I travel to my appointment. My email is an open book for many. The music I listen to is monitored by Spotify. The book I am reading is known by Amazon. And if I read strange books, it is monitored by security agencies. On the iCloud, Apple knows what kind of photos I make. And Netflix counts my average amount of horror movies. Or am I already in it? Who am I? Am I theirs? Many websites have dozens or even hundreds of tracking beacons embedded within the website that are sending information about the visitors of that, to that website to numerous companies, mostly advertising driven, that collect information. Many of them use advertising as their primary source of revenue and they believe that the more information they know about people, the better they can advertise, the more money they can make. Um, others simply have the mentality that the more data they collect, maybe later they'll figure out something useful to do with it. And that can be very dangerous because Obviously, maybe there will be beneficial uses, but the more information that's collected, the more likely it is that information is vulnerable to misuse. Things like credit card purchases, uh, for example, can be tied to your online persona. So it, it becomes more and more difficult for people to understand that their digital identity is not merely what they do registered, logged into a website, but it can be collected from everything they do in their lives online and even offline. Well, if, if you collect information about where someone is, that can reveal a great deal about a person, whether they attend a political rally, whether they go to a health clinic, um, you know, who they associate with, because you, if you have information about where multiple people are, you can see connections and, and patterns of activity. In fact, you can even predict where someone will be in the future based on where they have been in the past. So there's a great deal of information that comes solely from location information. And if you combine that information with other sources of information, you can learn even more about a person's interests. There's an opportunity for individuals and for civil society to really push these companies to be trustworthy, to be transparent, to give individuals greater control. Um, because there is value in our information and there is value in sharing our information, but it has to be under our control, under our, with our choice, and not simply something that happens outside of our comprehension, because that's where it can easily be abused, and even abused in ways that we don't recognize until later, and we may not even know what happened. So metadata is, is a difficult word to define. I mean, in the technical sense, it is data about data. Um, it's more commonly used to mean things other than the content of a communication. So if you take a picture, for example, the, the, the picture itself is the content. But for example, your camera might tag that picture with the time it was taken or even the location it was taken. Um, if you upload it to your, to your, to your account online, you may, that may be tagged with the IP address where you uploaded it from and it may be associated with your account. Um, there may be records of the people who have viewed that picture or the people who you intentionally shared it with. These could all be considered metadata in some sense, in the sense of they're not the picture itself, but they're information about the picture and how it has been used and who has viewed it. Um, they, they give a set of information that maybe the metadata of a single photo is not terribly relevant. It may show that I was, you know, I took a picture of the Eiffel Tower yesterday, so you could tell from that that I was in Paris, uh, you know, on a particular date, a particular time. Um, but taken in, in, in sum, the metadata of all my photos or of all my emails or my messages or, you know, anything else can reveal patterns of my lives. It can, again, reveal my connections, the people I associate with, the interests I have, the, you know, the regular habits that I have, and, and the times that I diverge from those. So they, it can give a great deal of information, in some ways even more than the pictures themselves.
I um, I collected and gathered uh, all my metadata for over a week, and I handed it over to a journalist. I um, I was really terrified when I got the first results. One of the things I uh, I did not realize was that the information or the information which was revealed by the metadata was in fact that it's not only information about me, but also information about my friends and about my coworkers and about everything I uh, communicate and, in, and interact with. But you can also make a lot of wrong assumptions uh, on that metadata. For example, according to the experiment and according to the results, they thought that I was a member or at least a follower of a certain political group. Some of the information was so sensitive that I uh, asked a journalist to, to censor that from the experiment because I didn't want that to, uh, to come into the public. It's over a year ago that I did the experiment. I still have a form of, well, you can call it self-censorship of the way I use search engines. It's really hard not to generate metadata because the metadata is, is generated every time we, we interact with each other. So you really have to abandon your digital devices, which is almost not doable in, in, in our daily life. And it's also not something uh, which I desire. I really love the, the age in which we live. I love to use my computer and my smartphone, uh, but it has disadvantages and you have to be extremely aware of those disadvantages. You have the knowledge originally about how your information will be used, you have better control over that. Now, if it's information cr created about you by someone else, if you are convicted of a crime and your photograph from a police lineup is posted online, you obviously didn't control that, you didn't choose that. It's very easy to see situations where, you know, I, I am denied a job I, because of my religion, I am denied a job because of my, you know, my health history information that should have been private, that has somehow been exposed, I may not ever know why I was denied this job, let alone who it is that released this information. So I think we have to be much more prospective in terms of, you know, releasing information itself is, is problematic. Now, there may, I mean, in many cases, releasing information itself is a harm. That's a different way of conceptualizing, is it is not, the harm is not the end, the end result of my losing out on a job or, or some other consequence. The harm is that you have violated my right to privacy by releasing my information. Uh, privacy is a very um, organic uh, concept, much more so than it used to be. Um, I do believe that people will always be able to protect their privacy if they demand governments, organizations, and companies to provide a part of it that will provide it. If you say that privacy is dead, as we've heard some other corporations say over, over the last few years, I think that the fact that uh, youngsters uh, shear away, stay away from Facebook and get into other types of social media proves that they have their own privacy and want to protect it, for example, from their parents, uh, from, uh, from other people in society. Uh, and this uh, will uh, remain a, a, a basic uh, demand and, and right for people uh, in the years to come. Of course, we adhere strictly to all kinds of uh, rules and regulations that are in place right now, um, uh, as we, of course, uh, uh, are obliged to do. Um, if you would look at um, um, how this would actually develop into more concrete terms, you could, for example, imagine a world in where there's a variety of levels of information um, that uh, have, an, uh, for example, a large impact on people's privacy. Uh, you can think about healthcare, education, other types of more sensitive types of information. If you would label those as such and would uh, more strictly um, look at how uh, the use of that data um, um, is uh, uh, done by governments, organizations, um, uh, then you would probably be able to better protect the privacy of people um, than in, uh, in a case where information is probably not so impactful on privacy and does better uh, to the public good, for example, in all kinds of research that would benefit um, public uh, health or other kinds of uh, um, things that we really think big data will benefit from. The, uh, it would be extremely important for the regulators to have a very strong mandate, uh, meaning that they will be able to define um, uh, what kinds of data are uh, specifically sensitive and how the use of the data might uh, lead to uh, more impactful privacy breaches. <laughs> Hopefully there's a market for companies and there are some companies out there who are working on strong encryption in a way that at least prevents the middleman from co continuously collecting information. We, we know very clearly that encryption is not foolproof, that if you are the target of a, a significant you know, NSA investigation, yeah. 
um, your information is going to be intercepted. Uh, you know, the, the best security minds in the world all think the same thing. Um, encryption does, however, inc dramatically increase the cost of ongoing collection and, and processing of information. And if you're trying to monitor everyone, it becomes impractical. Um, at least now, 10 years down the road, when there's quantum computing, all bets are off. But knowing that that's happening, knowing that the world is data-centric and that data about us is valuable, um, gives us the opportunity to really start having a dialogue about, well, what do we want? How can we make sure that these companies, these entities, these governments who are collecting information are responsible stewards, are giving us the control that we need and deserve, are making sure that the individual and the, uh, is central, that human rights are respected, that we have the control and the privacy that we need to live in a digital world as, you know, empowered individuals rather than as bits in a machine. I certainly don't think it's without challenge. I don't think it's at all guaranteed, uh, but I think it's possible. I think that continuing to educate people, continuing to push for greater transparency, um, continuing to increase literacy and awareness of these issues is essential. It will take time and effort and there's no guarantee of success, but I think there is a possibility that we can build a world where we can both take advantage of all the great things that technology services have to offer and keep control of our personal information. Thank <laughs> you.